copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. John is going to change scenes. Things are going to be different from here on out. The perspective is going to move from earth to heaven. You know, in the New Testament, the best I know, there's only two men that ever went to heaven, and only one was allowed to write about it. Uh, this is it. This is John giving us a vision of heaven from heaven. The Apostle Paul was called up there, but he wasn't allowed to talk about what he saw. But here we get the first-hand report of it. So let's read together what John has to say to us, and I'm going to spend the first part of the message talking about the things that we see in heaven, and then I'm going to spend the last part of the message talking about worship, because they are worshiping in heaven, and we can be informed about our worship on earth by studying what we know about worship in heaven. Here's what the Bible says. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and the one stand and one standing on the throne. I'm sorry, one sitting on the throne. Should have brought my glasses with me. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 el thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of burning fire before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne. And will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Heaven is a place I'd like to go. Can't wait to get there. Uh, we don't get the full extent of it in this passage or throughout the rest of Revelation. We just get a little foretaste of what's coming. Uh, well, I want you to see some things that John has to say to us about his trip up into heaven, and then we'll move into talking a little bit about worship toward the end. Uh, John begins by saying, After these things I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. The Bible says a door opened. Now heaven always biblically is up. Hell is down. Anybody can get to hell, but you can't just get to heaven, can you? You live in the first century, there's no airplanes. There's no gliders. There, there's nothing that's going to get you into heaven. Uh, by flying anyway. We've got those contraptions today, but even having those contraptions, you can't get there without going through the door. Uh, the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 9. Let me read one verse to you. Listen to how it says it. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, we talked about him being a high priest this morning, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
is speaking of heaven. Not made with hands, that is to say, listen, not of this creation. The heavenly realm is not of this creation. The Bible speaks of a first heaven, a second heaven, and a third heaven. The first heaven is where the clouds are, where the birds fly. The second heaven is outer space where the stars are. But there is a third heaven. But this third heaven is, we may think of it as another dimension. It's not part of this creation. A Russian astronaut can go up in outer space and talk about, well, I'm up here and I don't see God or heaven or anything like that. Ha, 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 real funny. But guess what? It's not part of this creation. You're not going to see it here. A dimensional door, it seems, opens up through which he traveled to get into heaven. You, but you don't get there. You, you're not going to find heaven on a planet. You're not going to find heaven in a black hole. You're not going to find heaven in outer space. It's a different place, not of this creation. And so this door opens that allows John to go into heaven, and he is called up in order to get there. The Bible says, after these things I looked, behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like the sound of a trumpet. That is Jesus. It comes from chapter 1, verse 10. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me the voice like the sound of a trumpet. So the same voice he heard in chapter 1, he hears again. Christ is calling out to him. And what is he saying to him? And when it sounds like a trumpet uh, blasting, come up here, and I'm going to show you what must take place after these things. Now, I shared with you that when I, when I first started preaching through Revelation, that I was going to tell you what I thought about things. And if you disagree with me, that's fine, because we can disagree about some things and we can still get along. Uh, but one of the things I have heard over the years is something I disagree with. And I, in fact, have found very few people that agree with it, but I have heard it. So you may have heard it and you may have even believed it. But some people look at John going up and say, well, that is a picture of the rapture of the church. I highly disagree with that. Uh, that is not everybody going up. That is one man going up. That is not supposed to be... Uh, demonstrating that the entire church is going into the air. It's just John. God's going to give John this vision to give to us. Uh, but it does have some similarities to the rapture, though, doesn't it? Uh, so you hear the sound of a trumpet. You're being caught up in the air. He's going to meet the Lord. So there's, there's something there in common with it. But I would not hold to that being everybody or some kind of symbolic thing that demonstrates that's everybody going up there. But I can tell you why some people probably thought that. It's because of something else I told you I didn't believe. I don't believe that the churches that we read in chapter 2 and 3 are church ages. And I shared with you about that earlier on. Uh, so some would think that the last church demonstrates the last church age and then there's the rapture of the church. And they're reading things in and finding things there that I don't believe God meant for us to find. But nevertheless, there's a door and John is called up, hearing the voice calling him up into heaven. And the Bible says, come up here and I'm going to show you the things that must take place after these things. Now don't jump over that word must. Anytime you hear something that must happen in the Bible, that's not a, it might happen. That's not a, well, it could happen. It's going to happen. Uh, the Bible says there are several things that must happen. For instance, John that wrote this book said in his uh, gospel account that Jesus spoke and said, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so I must be lifted up. Christ was going to be lifted up on a cross to hang between heaven and earth and die for our sin. And this Jesus is raised from the dead, and we are going to see him appear in chapter 5. Chapters 4 and 5 in this part of Revelation go together. But we're not going to get to chapter 5 tonight. But Jesus said that he must be lifted up. Why must he be lifted up? That was his purpose in coming. That's why he showed up on this earth. He came to give his life, to die as a sacrifice for sin, that he might be raised again for our salvation. That must take place. Jesus said, you must worship in spirit and in truth. You can't worship any other way apart from that. And so if your worship is real and legitimate, it must be from the heart, by the power of the spirit, 
and it must be based on truth. You can't worship based on a lie. And something else Jesus said must happen. He looked at a man by the name of Nicodemus and said this to him, you must be born again. Every single person has to have a second birth. You have a birth. Mine was March 7th, 1971. I'm 48 years old. Next year I'll be 49. I'm knocking on the door of some black balloons. Uh, I've got a birth. But when I was 21 years old, I was born again. I've got a second birth. There's a day that the old me died and new me came to live. It was an old me that didn't know Jesus. It was lost and on his way to hell. And the new me came because Jesus changed my life, saved my soul. My heart's different now, and it's all because of Jesus. The day I said by faith, Jesus, I believe in you, I trust in you, and I receive you, God changed who I am. And he changed the direction of my life as well as the final destination of my soul. I was born again. If you've never had a day where you've been born again into the family of God, you need to have that day that you can say, that's the day. God changed my life forever. And the Bible says here there are some things that must take place after these things. He says after these things twice in this verse. He begins it and he ends it. After these things. What things? Well, let me remind you that John has given us an outline for his book. If you look at verse 19 in chapter 1, John said that he was told to write the things which you have seen, I told you that was chapter 1, the things which are, that's chapters 2 and 3, and the things that will take place, look how it ends, after these things. This is future. This is prophetic. This is end time stuff. So John saw some things. He reported them. There were some things that were happening. He told you about those things right then and there. But now he's going to get to the last things, the end time things, the things that are coming after these things. And so when you get here in chapter 4, this is when you begin the third part of the outline, most of the book dealing with what comes after these things. So that's where we're going to go in this text, and it's going to give us a perspective from heaven looking down. You know, you've got in economics, you've got Macro and you've got micro. Macro is big picture stuff. Micro is small picture stuff. Your family's microeconomics, big pictures, uh, macroeconomics. The whole country, all the families of the nation put together. We're going to get the big picture sort of view from heaven with what John's going to tell us throughout the book of Revelation. So we are in the last part in this age. So after these things. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And so that's the Holy Spirit, and he is called up. This sounds very similar to Ezekiel, who seems to leave his body behind and is kind of pulled out of his body, his soul, and taken that way. That seems to be what's happening here, but again, who knows? <laughs> you don't really know. Uh, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. This throne is going to appear 12 times throughout this chapter. Over and over again, he talks about the throne. He's fascinated with it. He sees it, and, and he speaks of it over and over again. You know, a throne signifies a king. Back when I played ball when I was a little boy, I'd go out to the ballpark, and when we played baseball, you know, you had clay everywhere, and so the guys that would work on the fields would bring maybe dump trucks full of clay and just dump them out there, so when you needed them, you could Pull in a, put it in a you know, wheelbarrow with a shovel and take it out and put it on the pitcher's mound or whatever. So there's always these big mountains. And, you know, we loved as little boys play King of the Mountain. You get up on top of that thing and, you know, somebody come and try to knock you off. And then if you got somebody that you try to knock them off. And if you're at the top, you got an advantage, but you can't stay there forever. Um, it was a lot of fun because you could die doing it and, you know, it was dangerous and you get hurt. And it, it was great. So I guess I say all that because, you know, Jesus... He's the king of the mountain. God is the king of the mountain. Uh, there's a throne, and he's on top, and nobody's knocking him off. He is sovereign. He is ruling. God is reigning supreme over all of his creation. So he's called up into heaven, and he's taken to the throne room of God, and he sees one sitting on the throne. 
And verse 3 describes what he sees. He says, he's, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. A jasper stone would be like a clear stone. It may be white, kind of like a diamond. Sardis would be red. So bright, white, and red. If you can imagine going into a jewelry store and looking under the lights as a jeweler takes a, you know, maybe a black cloth and puts some beautiful diamonds and rubies on there, he starts to see sparkling and light and amazement. Uh, it is God is beautiful, and, and he's just describing these colors he sees as he looks at the one sitting on the throne. And the Bible says there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Uh, he doesn't see half of the bow. He sees an entire circle, all of the bow there. And, and probably it's not so much a rainbow as it's almost like a halo effect. Have you ever gone swimming and, and gotten in the pool and, and your eyes are burning and they're hurting and they're red and, and maybe at nighttime you get out and then you look at a light that's lit up and you see kind of a halo effect around that light? I think that's what it's kind of like, what it's kind of trying to describe. But again, I'm not there, I hadn't seen it, but I, I think that's what he sees. He sees this, this rainbow all around the throne. So it sounds like Christmas to me, to be honest. You got white, red, and green. So now Christmas time, you think about what John sees when you see the red and the green and the, and the white lights, maybe. Uh, but he says, I, I saw a jasper, saw, like Jasper, like Sardis, and a rainbow around the throne, emerald in appearance. I'll talk about that rainbow a little bit more in a minute. Around the throne were 24 elders. On the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed with white garments, golden crowns on their head. A lot of debate about who these elders are. Nobody really knows. You just got to make a guess. I have read that some believe that these are angels, but I highly doubt it. And I say I doubt it because over in chapter 7, verse 11, it says the angels were standing around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces and worshiped God. Uh, in, in that verse, it distinguishes between angels and these elders. So I don't think they're the same thing. Uh, there, there's actually a, a numerology sort of thing that Jewish people had. They had this way of numbers meant something, each number meant something. But who in the world knows what 24 means? Um, that's kind of just one of those things out there. So I'll just give you my best guess of what this is. I think this is sort of a representation of all the saved of all time before the throne. And I say that thinking Old Testament, you had 12 tribes of Israel. New Testament, you had 12 apostles, the foundation that the church was built upon. You, you take that, you put it together, you get to 24, you get Old and New Testament coming together. So I believe around the throne of God in heaven, it, it seems like this circle goes around the throne. It's not like a semicircle, but it could be. You can't really tell from the way it's written. But around the throne, either all the way around it or either in a semicircle, that you see these 24 elders, and I think that's probably a representation of, of all the people that are saved in heaven. But again, who knows? Because... You'd have to ask John. Remember how this book started in the very first verse, what he said? He said, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. And when I told you about that word communicated, it means to make known by signs. So when you have a sign, you kind of got to know what it means, and if you don't know what it means, you're just guessing. Sometimes I'm guessing, and like I said, I'm going to tell you what I think, and we hope some of it's right. Maybe all of it. You never know. Maybe none of it. But you got 24 elders, and they're clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Another reason I, I think these are, are people and not angels, I don't really see angels wearing crowns. But I see believers wearing crowns. Now, white is the garment of heaven. It's a garment of purity. It's a garment of holiness. It's a, it's a garment that, that, you know, if there's a spot of uncleanness on it, it's going to stick out naturally. But these are pure 
white robes that they're wearing. And we've been told by Jesus over and over again, and we see it throughout this book, that there's coming a day when we're going to wear robes of white. Let me see if I can find something here. Chapter 3, verses 4, it says, You have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Um, he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name out of the book of life. You see it again in verse uh, 11, speaking of a crown of that chapter. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Uh, back in chapter 2, I'm, I'm positive it says it there. Be faithful unto death, verse 10 says. I will give you the crown of life. Let's see if I say another one here. Um, what it talks about in verse 26 and 27, I'm going to give authority over the nations. He shall rule them with the rod of iron as vessels of pottery are broken to pieces as I have received authority from my Father. So Jesus has authority. He shares that authority with us. We rule and reign with Christ. We wear crowns. Let me remind you of something else that this book started with. Let me see if I can find it here. In verse 6 of chapter 1, he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. And so it seems like around this throne, what are we seeing? We're seeing the kingdom of God as kings, and priests, robed in white, wearing crowns. And so this is the scene in heaven, I believe. Those that are the redeemed, who have left the earth and gone on, they are there around this throne, throne that is glowing with a, a, a rainbow that is emerald, emerald being green, white stone, and ruby stone in appearance upon the throne is God. And the Bible says in verse 5, out of, their throne came flash, out of the throne came flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder. Now, y'all remember that Garth Brooks song, The Thunder Rolls? Yeah, everybody know that song? What's thunder and lightning indicative of? <laughs> judgment's about to come, right? You know, that guy was, and that song's about to have judgment day come upon him. The thunder was rolling. His wife's about to get him. Um... God's about to pour his judgment out. It's judgment day is coming and it's close. There's lightnings and there's rumblings, this thunder. And so we're about to get a taste of it. And so when he sees the lightning and the, the thunder, I believe it's indicative of what's about to follow. The Bible says there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. Remember that comes from Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 where the Holy Spirit of God is described in seven different ways. And I've shared with you that it's kind of like saying about me, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a pastor. So Greg, the pastor, the father, the husband, the, I don't know, doofus. I mean, you pick whatever you want to there. But uh, seven ways of describing me, that's the Holy Spirit of God in all of his fullness. Where is he? He's around the throne of God in heaven. So as you see the Father upon the throne, you see the Spirit there in the midst of the people before the, the throne of God. And so the Bible says after that, that the, um, I've lost my place here. Uh, there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. You know, crystal's beautiful under light too. Uh, I was looking at some water the other day with the sun just reflecting off of it. It was calm, it was smooth, it was beautiful. And so heaven, the floor of heaven, think of it this way. It's like an ocean of crystal. And think of what that might have looked like with all the light coming from the throne, with the, with the rainbow around the throne, and, and the light reflecting off this ocean of glass. Not, not a raging ocean, not scary, but, but just calm and smooth, a sea, an ocean of glass. Next time you go out to the ocean and see the sun reflecting off of it, let your mind's eye go to what you're reading here and think about how John described heaven like an ocean of glass. Not liquid, because you're not going to fall through, you're not going to sink, but something special and wonderful and beautiful. Around the th Before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, crystal, and in the center around the throne, four living creatures. 
full of eyes in front and behind. Now, I don't know about the eyes in front and behind because that sounds kind of nasty, but, um, but those are probably angels there. And I say that because these are mirrors of what you would see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter uh, 10 when, if you were to read that book, and these are described there. And, and actually, they're not described in Ezekiel as having one face, but they have four faces. So, uh, again, sounds weird to me, sounds strange and odd. I've never seen anything like that before. You haven't either. Uh, but they're described as a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle. Now, what in the world's going on with that? Well, angels are spiritual beings, and spiritual beings can make an appearance, and I guess they can choose how they want to appear. God can make them appear how he wants them to appear. Um, I find that there might be some commonality with one thing in the Bible, and I'm going to read it to you. It's from Genesis 9. Remember that Noah was a man that God put him and his family on an ark, and he kept them safe when he flooded the earth. And when after the flood was over and they came down, what did they see? A rainbow. And God made a promise. He made a covenant. And listen to how it goes. I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, every beast of the earth, all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. Uh, the birds, the cattle, the beast, and the man. Uh, what did these angels represent that were before the throne of God? A lion, it's a beast. An eagle, it's a flying animal. Cattle, it's an ox, and a man. Same things here. Uh, in, in my mind, it goes there because already he's seeing what? He's seeing a rainbow. And now the very ones that he made the covenant with that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. It seems to me like this, almost like God has placed a reminder in heaven of what he said in earth. That it is so solid and sure that God is never going to do this again. That not only does God have a rainbow around his throne, he also has before him the very representation of the ones that he promised to protect by never sending the flood again. Now that's my guess. Again, I don't know. But these are four creatures represented as these angels with wings and faces and eyes everywhere. And the eyes may be a way of describing sparkling. I don't know, but um, who knows, right? Four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, so here's where we come to a time of worship in heaven. Uh, we've got this picture where around the throne there are these elders that we think might be the redeemed of the all time sitting before the throne, uh, on their thrones with crowns and robes as kings and priests. Uh, we find that angels are there around the throne, that there's a rainbow even in heaven and even a representation of those that God is through the angels that God has said that he would protect by never flooding the earth. The Spirit of God is there. God is on the throne. Only one left. We're looking for Jesus. He shows up and makes a grand appearance in chapter 5 that we'll get to in a few weeks. But now let's look at how they worship God uh, before we end this chapter. Uh, around the throne day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So they're praising God, verbally praising God, unceasingly praising God. When you think about worship, what do you think about? Well, worship is your response to God's revelation of himself. God reveals himself through his works, through his word, through his son. And the appropriate way to respond based on how God has revealed himself to you, well, that's your worship that you show to God. What is God worth to you? How much does God matter to you? What do you think of God? Uh, that's how I usually think about the word worship, worth-ship. 
And, and so you demonstrate the magnitude that, that, that God uh, is worth to you in your life by the way that you respond to his revelation of himself. Uh, these angels that are before the throne, they are crying out nonstop, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So they are praising him. And so a part of an act of worship can be to praise God for who he is. And God's very nature is that he is holy. You can say a lot of things about God. There's a lot that could be said. But of all the things the angels can say about God and do say about God, both Old and New Testament, over and over again, what do they say? He is holy, holy, holy. This is the distinctive characteristic of God's nature that sets him apart from everything else. In fact, everything else flows from that. Uh, the Bible doesn't say they cry out, God is love, love, love. God is peace, peace, peace. He is those things, but they come from his holiness of his nature. And so they, they describe that over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I don't think they're very quiet when they say it either. You know, Baptists are bad about that. Baptists like to... We like to whisper. We like to be dignified. We, shh, quiet. You think they're dignified in heaven like that? I don't. I think they're, they're loud. I think it's holy, holy, holy. I, I think they're getting at it, man. They're, they're going to it. I mean, it's, they're not holding back. Uh, they are praising God unceasingly, shouting before the throne over who God is. And there may be an idea within crying this three different times it may be a triune, Trinitarian signal here. Holy is the Father. Holy is the Son. Holy is the Spirit. Does it say that? But it may be implied. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The saying he's the Lord means he is what? He is sovereign. Our God that is holy is sovereign. Praise him for who he is. He is the Almighty. That means he's all-powerful. He's full of power. He is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. You know, in my Bible, that's a King James Version, I think in the chapter 1, I've got that, because that Bible that I've got has red and black letters in it. I've got it in red, meaning that someone made a determination. They thought that that was Jesus that was speaking. But in chapter 1, the one who was and is and is to come is the Father. The Father's coming. Remember that God's plan from the very beginning was God and man together. In the Garden of Eden, you saw man and God walking together in the cool of the day in the garden. And what God started, he finishes. God's intention will be realized. There's coming a day when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will dwell among men, or men will dwell among them, however you want to say it. But we will live in the presence of God Almighty forever and ever without end. The Father is coming. And the fullness of God will be in the presence of the fullness of God forever and ever. You can praise him for his holiness. You can praise him for his sovereignty. You can praise him for his power. You can praise him for his eternality. Because he was, he is, he always will be. God without end, amen. He's not the I was, he's the I am. He always will be. He started it all, he's going to be there to no end. He's coming. And the Bible says that when they are speaking here, or I guess we can imply this, that when they are talking about the one who was and is and is to come, you know what they're doing is all they're doing is saying the same thing that God has said about himself. He says in verse 8 of chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Have you ever thought about as part of your worship that you can say back to God the very things that he has said about himself? Have you ever thought about your prayer as an act of worship? And in your time of prayer, to maybe open up the Psalms and to read a psalm, and then to pray it back to God. Maybe not even the whole thing, but to see something within the word and to say to God something that he has already said about himself and let that be an act of worship. They're verbally praising God. Uh, they're, they're, they're also, though, using the word of God as part of their act of worship. 
and they're praising God for who he is just as his very nature. And then the Bible says that the worship spills over. Verse 9 says, When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him. And so when, when the living creatures are crying out, holy, 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 and they're, and they're praising God and they're worshiping him in that way, the Bible says they do three things here. They give him glory, honor, and thanks. To give God glory, something that's weighty, something that's heavy. That's what that word glory implies. Uh, what is glorious? Something that's wonderful and weighty. Well, God is certainly that. And to, and to describe him and worship him and praise him in that way is so appropriate. The word honor uh, is a word that's often used for a precious, rare, even a unique sort of gem that is very, very valuable. It shows the value of a thing when you honor it. They glorified God. They honored God. And then the Bible says they thank God. What do you owe God? What are you thankful for? What has he done for you? You know, so often in times of worship, we, we just jump over that. We don't thank him enough. God, I appreciate you. God, I love you. God, all you've done for me. I could never thank you enough. I owe you a debt. I could never even start to begin to repay. What has God done for you? Because even the angels are thanking them. Thank you, God, for making me. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, for my family. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The living creatures give glory, honor, and thanksgiving. Should thanksgiving be part of worship? Absolutely. They give thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. This is another thing about worship, is that worship should be or can be all of you. I mean, in other words, all of you should participate in the worship. And you're, you're a physical being. You've got a body. And so when you respond to God as he's beginning to work in your life and reveal himself to you, is it appropriate to bow down? At times it is. Very appropriate response. What about to raise your hand? What about to raise both your hands? What about to jump up? Sometimes it's okay to run, isn't it? You ever get so excited you just take off running? You got so much energy you can't, you're about to bust? What about dancing? That'd mess you all up, wouldn't it? Let me tell you something. I promise you. Listen, th this is where Americans, we miss it. At least the white American church. Now, I'm not being racist here, but I mean, there, there's some churches that are mostly white. And I'm telling you, when I go to Africa, listen, you don't just sing songs. They're dancing, buddy. I wish I could dance. I'd do it, but I, I'd embarrass myself if I tried. If Y'all laugh at me till no end. I'd be on YouTube. Just um, I'd be a meme or something. Like that. It'd be awful if I even tried it. Um, I've told y'all before. They they asked a pastor one time, "Can Baptists dance?" He said, "Well, some can, some can't. I'm one of those that can't." But let me tell you, they can dance in Africa, and I've been five times, and they they get down with it. There's not a thing sexual about it. It's all worship, but they put their whole body into it. I've seen it here in America where Jewish believers, man, they got these flags, they wave them, they hoop, and they holler, and they stand, and they just dance. We're kind of tame, aren't we? We could learn something. Get your whole body into it. It's all right. There's nothing wrong with it. And sometimes you're up doing that, and sometimes what are you doing? You're on your face before God. That's what happens in heaven. My pastor is there now the one that died a little over a year ago. He said there's been times he's got on his face before God and he dug a hole in the ground to put his nose in. He said, I want to get as low as I can. They fell on their face before God. 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. They worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne. Now, Here's what's interesting. I don't know if it's almost a spontaneous thing. Have you ever seen them rip the caps off at a graduation and fling them? Or if it's a 
as they're going down, take it off and place it before him. Don't know. But it could be either one, and neither one would be bad, would it? I remember seeing Billy Graham one time. He was at the White House before he left to, to go to heaven. And he was receiving some kind of award. And, and here's what I remember about it. I, I can't even remember what award it was. It may have been like a Presidential Medal of Honor or something. It was pretty pretty big, whatever it was. But And he was happy to get it. But do you know why he was happy? You know what he said after he got it? He said, this is just one more thing that I'll have to lay at the feet of Jesus. That's why he wanted it. Give me something that I can worship God with by giving it right back to him. Isn't that a part of worship? Why do they have the crowns? Well, the only reason they've got them is God gave them to them. And so when you take what God's given you and you recognize where it came from, how you got it, that you really don't deserve it, and that the truth is everything that you have, you have because of him, and he is worthy, not you, but him, worthy of all the praise and honor and glory, and you lay it down to recognize that's worship, isn't it? That's what they're doing in heaven. God, you are worthy. Worthy are you, verse 11 says, our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power. Let me ask you a question. Does that read odd to you? How does God, who is all-powerful, the Almighty, how does God receive power? How does he receive glory and honor and power? Those three are listed together. Worthy are you to receive glory, honor, and power. Here's what I think is going on. Every part of God's creation in some way is glorious. And every bit of power and glory and honor that is in the created order that God has spoken into existence, they should return that to God and honor him with what he's given. Just like the crowns are laid down, if America was to honor God, we'd give him all the riches, all the power, everything uh, that, that, that America has. We, we'd just say, God, it's all from you. It's all because of you. You are worthy of it all. And if we worshiped him the way we should, we'd just give him everything. And I think that's what it's saying here. Is that, that's how he gets it. If there's a king that is sovereign and has power, if that king were to honor God and worthy, uh, see God as worthy and would worship him, then what would he say? God, this crown I wear, this power that I've received, it's your power. I have it because of you. God, if I've been honored in any way, I'm honored because of you. God, if there's anything glorious to me or my life, God, truly, you get all the glory. Worthy are you to receive glory, honor, and power. Why is God worthy? Well, it answers that question. You've created all things. Because of your will, they existed, and they were created. You know what he's describing there? He's describing what God's done in the past. He's describing what God's doing right now. He's describing the future. God created everything that's created. You want to know why we're here? There's a creator. That's why there's a creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, there's your answer. God made it all. That's why it's here. God took from nothing spoken into existence, ex nihilo. He caused it to be. You created what things? All things. Everything that has been created has been created by God. Where did God come from? God didn't come from anywhere. God just has always existed. He is the uncaused cause and everything else exists because of him you created all things and because of your will they exist and they were created and that which exists and that which is created he sustains it and will continue to sustain it he is worthy of all praise and honor and glory honor him with your mouth honor him with your life honor him with your power whatever is good and glorious in your life Credit him for it, 
praise him for it. Worship him with your heart. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship him because he is worthy. Because the one that created everything, if you're a believer, has two claims on your life. He owns you not just because he made you, but through Jesus and his death on a cross, he has bought you back. He has redeemed you. You are twice owned by God. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Let's praise his name. Father, we love you. We thank you for this night, for the people that are here. God, I pray we leave with hearts full, thinking about heaven, thinking about those that we know that are there, about what might be happening even right now. And God, I pray that the desire of our heart when we leave here would be that we would work in such a way so that in heaven there would be more to lay at your feet. God, I pray that we'd be motivated by that day when we might give back to you that which you've given to us. And as an act of worship for all of creation, declare you are worthy, you are worthy. God, help us to be motivated in that way. In the name of Jesus. Let's stand up and let's sing one more.